Hey, how's it going everyone? It's Ernest from Shipastute. In this video, we're doing a destination review of Zion National Park, an incredible place to visit and explore in Utah. A lot of you know that we're huge fans of the national parks. I honestly find hiking and exploring the national parks to not only be a refreshing experience, but also a humbling one. There's no video or photo that can fully capture the scale and beauty of these places. Being at a national park allows us to switch off for a bit and become more present with both ourselves and our environment. Zion National Park is in Southwest Utah, about three hour drive from Las Vegas International Airport. It's next to a city called Springdale and it's about 22 square miles. It was originally inhabited by Native American tribes and later settled by Mormon settlers in the mid 19th century. We've actually been to Zion National Park twice. The first time was in early 2017, before we even launched the channel, and the second time was last summer in 2018. Both times were a different experience, especially since certain activities are seasonal or were closed due to recent storms. Before we jump in, if you're new here, welcome to our channel. Tripasuit is a travel channel that is focused on sharing ways to make travel easier, affordable, and more enjoyable. Traveling can be stressful and expensive, so we're looking for ways to help you maximize your experience through travel tips, points of miles, and innovative gear. If that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing. In this video, I want to review some of our favorite hikes while visiting the park, as well as some tips in case you're planning a visit. I'll also include the difficulty rating for each of the hikes so you can gauge whether it's something you may want to do. So let's start with our favorite hikes. Number one, the Narrows. Hiking the Narrows is probably the most iconic activity at Zion National Park. It's a hike through the narrowest section of Zion Canyon. It's an aquatic hike, so you'll be walking upstream through the river. There are two versions of the hike. The most common is the bottom up hike, which doesn't require a special permit. You basically start at the Temple of Sinawaba and follow a paved trail about one mile until the end of the riverbank. At that point, you'll hike upstream toward an area called Wall Street, which is absolutely gorgeous. The area has canyon walls that are 1,500 feet tall. To see Wall Street, it's about six miles round trip, about four miles of which is in the water. The water level and current depends on the day and weather conditions. When we did it in August 2018, the water was mostly knee to waist deep. When we got toward the end of Wall Street though, the water level was chest high at some points, so you'll want to be careful. The hike took about three to four hours to complete. You'll want to pack your valuables and electronics in dry bags, wear closed toed shoes, and rent a hiking stick. The stick is actually very important as it will give you another point of contact in the river, which is helpful in areas where the current is strong. You can also rent special shoes for the hike, but we opted to use old pairs of sneakers that were at the end of their life. Just don't wear sandals or flip-flops. We saw a few people attempt it and they were bleeding from scraping their feet on the rocks and completely miserable. Also, if you're doing the hike during cold weather, you wanna rent or pack a wetsuit to keep you warm. There are several hiking stores in the area where you can rent gear and get more information. Number two, observation point. This hike starts at the Weeping Rock Trailhead and ends at one of the most scenic spots in Zion National Park. It's an eight mile round trip hike that's mostly uphill. The trail goes through Echo Canyons and along White Cliffs. If you make it to the end, you'll have gained 2,100 feet in elevation. This is a strenuous day hike that takes about four to six hours to complete. You'll likely be in sunlight during most of the hike, so be prepared with both hats and water. I actually felt a bit dizzy toward the end of this hike because it was so warm and we had misjudged how much water we actually needed for the hike. Number three, Angel's Landing. This is another iconic hike in the park. It also has a reputation of being one of the most dangerous as there have been hikers that have fallen and died on this trail. The hike takes about three to six hours and is about five miles round trip. The elevation change is about 1,500 feet and is generally classified as a strenuous hike. The trail consists of steep switchbacks. You'll be hiking along narrow ridges and holding onto chains as you make your final ascent to Angel's Landing. We noticed several people who were panicking along the final stretch. Since hikers have died on this last stretch, it can be a bit nerve wracking. However, if you stay focused on the trail and make sure you maintain points of contact at all times, you should be okay. Of course, if you're uncomfortable or anxious, I don't recommend the final stretch as you'll find yourself having to backtrack along the same narrow path. Since this is a technical hike, I don't recommend it for younger hikers or those who may not be conditioned to handle the stress. This trail does get crowded, which means that you'll have to pass one another on some of the narrow ridges. Take it slow and make sure you're aware of the conditions. For example, when we did the hike in early 2017, we were told that there was some ice on the trail. We packed our stabilizers, which gave us extra traction when stepping through snow and ice on the trail. 
Number four, the subway. This is probably the most spectacular and difficult hike that I've ever done. It's a permit only hike, so you'll need to apply in order to do this hike. The hike can be completed in two different ways. One is bottom up, which is what we did. The other is top down, which requires rappelling and swimming through the pools of water. The hike is extremely technical, so I wouldn't suggest doing it unless you're an avid hiker and feel confident about doing a long hike. We carried enough food and water in case we happen to get stuck on the trail. Since it's not an easily accessible trail, you want to be prepared in case you have to wait for emergency services to arrive in the event that you get stuck or injured. Also, the hike was recently in the news since a pair of hikers were caught in quicksand. Again, this is not a hike that I would even attempt in adverse weather. Number five, Emerald Pools. Another beautiful and popular hike in Zion is the Emerald Pools. It's an easy three mile round trip hike to the lower pool. In fact, this is a good trail if you have younger children, baby strollers, or wheelchairs. The trail features some very scenic views, waterfalls, and pools. The trails to the middle and upper pools are a bit more challenging, though worth the effort. The trails are great, especially if the weather is warm. The moisture from the waterfalls and pools, as well as the general vegetation, should help to keep you cool. Number six, Hidden Canyon. This was a less popular hike when we visited, but was also one of our favorites. It's about three miles total and about a thousand feet elevation gain to get to the Hidden Canyon. The hike is fairly tough and adventurous, including some sections with chains. Once you get to the canyon, you'll do some scrambling to continue onward on the trail. This was one of our favorite trails in Zion. We've only done it when there was snow, but we would love to return and do this trail again in the warmer weather. Number seven, Canyon Lookout. For those of you that may not want to do a long hike, you'll want to check out the Canyon Lookout. This is a one mile round trip hike that's easy and perfect for families. You'll basically drive on Route 9 through the Zion Mount Carmel Tunnel to get to the trailhead. It's a great place to get some beautiful shots of the Zion Valley. While it's an easy hike that's perfect for families, you'll still want to exercise caution on the trail, especially if you're traveling with little ones. There are a few spots that are exposed and the snow and ice can sometimes build up on the trail. In terms of lodging, it really depends on your budget and travel style. There are camping sites and a lodge in the park. However, we opted for a more boutique hotel just outside the park gate called the Flanagan's Inn. We've stayed there on both visits and love the inn's restaurant as well. You can even book the hotel on Chase's travel portal if you want to use points to pay for the lodging, which is what we did. If you're planning a trip to Zion National Park, here are a couple extra things to keep in mind. Number one, size. What we love about Zion National Park is that it's really easy to get around and explore. Some national parks like Yosemite or Sequoia are massive and require a lot of time to fully experience the area. Zion, on the other hand, is a bit more approachable in size. Most of the attractions are within a 30 minute drive or shuttle ride from the entrance, making it a much easier park to explore, especially if you have impatient kids. Number two, pack snacks and lots of water. This is a consistent tip whenever we talk about visiting a national park and is especially important in Zion. We noticed that only some of the trailheads have water stations and fountains, so fill up your water before you take the shuttle to your trail. We actually ran out of water while hiking the Observation Point Trail, and I started to feel a little bit lightheaded toward the end of the hike. We made sure to carry more water on our other hikes. In fact, we doubled the amount of water when we went on the subway hike the following day. Also, don't assume that you'll need less water if you're doing an aquatic hike. You'll be exerting a lot of energy while hiking, so you'll want to carry enough water for the entire day. Number three, wear appropriate footwear and clothing. A common thing that you'll see in Zion when hiking the Narrows is people attempting to hike it in flip-flops. That's a really bad idea. Your foot will get scraped along the rocks. You'll see a lot of people realizing their mistake and painfully turning back during the hike. Also, I recommend wearing layers as the temperature can be drastically different, especially when you're going up 1,500 to 2,000 feet in elevation. I wore my wool t-shirts and hoodie, and both were great at keeping me comfortable and dry. Number four, check the parking and shuttle schedule. If you're traveling to Zion during the peak season, you'll likely be using the park shuttle to get to the different trailheads. The schedule changes every year, so you'll wanna check the National Park Service's website for more information. For example, the first time we visited Zion National Park was in February, 2017. During that visit, the shuttles were not running, so we were able to drive to all the hikes. But when we visited in August, 2018, cars were not allowed on the main road, so we used the shuttle to get around. Number five, be flexible and have backup options. Make sure you check the National Park's website for any closures to the trails. Trail closures are common due to storm damage and rockfall. Many of the hikes that are in or along the river will be affected by water levels and currents. 
You'll want to follow any warnings and instructions from the rangers. Getting stuck in a flash flood is probably the biggest risk on these trails, so play it safe. There are plenty of hikes in the area that you can do that won't be affected by the water level. Number six, stop at the visitor center. The visitor center is a great place to get additional information about the hikes and weather conditions. There are rangers in the visitor center who can give you advice and even provide you maps on the different hikes. It's also where you'll pick up any permits like we did when we applied for the subway hike. Number seven, get equipped with the right gear. While you can complete most of the hikes with basic sneakers and a backpack, I do recommend investing in rugged and comfortable footwear and backpacks that are padded. On the subway and narrows hike, I was carrying about 40 pounds of weight, mostly water, food, and camera gear. Having a comfortable pack, durable hiking shoes with a lot of grip, and the right clothing materials like wool and stretch fabrics help make the experience more enjoyable. Also, I highly recommend packing some insulated water bottles. You'll appreciate having cold water, especially when you're hiking up the steep inclines. Number eight, don't take unnecessary risks. You'll see a lot of people taking selfies along the edges of cliffs. While I'm not opposed to taking pictures, I don't recommend dangling your feet along the edge or letting yourself get distracted. The wind at higher elevations is unpredictable and it's easy to get distracted or startled when on the trail. Number nine, get a national park annual pass. The cost to enter the park depends on whether you drive in or walk in to use a shuttle. As of March, 2019, the cost per person is $20. If you're driving into the park, then you'll pay $35 for your vehicle. Both of these passes are valid for seven days. Though if you plan to visit more national parks, you may wanna consider an annual pass for $80. It lasts for an entire year and can be shared with another person. Pass allows you to admit three additional adults when entering a park as well. Number 10, pack sunglasses, hats, and sunscreen. Many of the popular hikes like Angel's Landing and Observation Point do not have a lot of shade. This means that you'll likely be exposed to a lot of sunlight with little opportunity to find any shade. Make sure you pack sunglasses, hats, and sunscreen. Also, I recommend starting your hikes early in the day. You'll take advantage of the sun's position and also experience fewer crowds on the trails. Number 11, pack hand sanitizer and wipes. This is another tip that we often share when traveling, especially to national parks. Most of the bathrooms do not have running water, so bringing hand wipes and sanitizer can help you feel clean and comfortable. Number 12, leave no trace. During the government shutdown earlier this year, the national parks experienced a lot of damage, some of which is irreversible. You wanna make sure that you protect yourself and the park when exploring. This means not damaging or altering the environment, following safety precautions, avoid feeding any wildlife, and always disposing of any trash or waste. Also, a big pet peeve of mine is seeing people hike while playing loud music. It's not only considerate to other hikers, but the sounds can often echo through the canyon affecting the wildlife. We obviously went through the hikes very quickly, so if you're planning to do any of these hikes, make sure you take the time to research each trail. I'll include some helpful links in the video description and our website. We may also do a separate video at some point on the subway hike since there's so much to cover. Have you ever been to Zion National Park? If so, what was your favorite hike? Let us know in the comment section below. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful, please give us a thumbs up and consider sharing our video with others. It really helps us growing our channel and our community. Until next time, travel safe, and travel smart.